From the studio of Take One, this is White Space, a space for ordinary people to share their experiences on common human emotions. I'm your host, Susan Angami, and welcome to the first episode of White Space. Earlier this summer, we invited essays on real stories to start this podcast, and we want to thank all of you who wrote in and shared your stories with us. For our first season, we are exploring grief in all its varied forms, from fleeting moments to lasting memories and everything in between. And this episode is about navigating through the different emotions that come after a loss and learning to live with grief thereafter. This story is shared by 27-year-old Kamrila Tonger from Kohima in her essay, Finding Strength in Vulnerability. The essay is read by Anungla Zoe Longkamer, an artist based in Dimapur. Here is Finding Strength in Vulnerability. Every year on the 15th of February, I put aside all my work and make myself a warm meal. I rest. I allow myself to feel every emotion that the day brings. It was on this day in 2009 that I lost my dear mother, my precious. We learned of her sickness late so the cancer cells had already spread to her organs. Like any other cancer patient, she had to undergo chemotherapy and radiation. I was in the seventh grade when she had to travel outside the state for her treatment. It was the first time we had gone so long without our parents being at home. My biggest regret till this day is this. My parents had returned from Imphal after my mom completed several tests. School had just ended so I ran to my parents' room. Mom was resting on the bed. She saw me and put her arms out for a hug and I did hug her but I did not cry. I really, really wanted to but I didn't. And to this day, my heart really aches when I think about that moment. I should have cried and told her how much I missed her, how much it hurt to see her being sick. By the time she returned from Bombay on completion of her chemo and radiation treatment, she had lost her hair, even some weight, but her smile never faded. Rather, she was more excited to show me the stuff she had bought for me. One of the most precious things among them was a huge doll which I named Bobby. He had round eyes and could easily be used as a pillow, which I did for many years after mom's death. I continue to hold on to these things for dear life. I studied in Little Flower High Secondary School till the 10th grade and the rule there for students with long hair was to braid it into two. Since nursery, mom had always done this task. Even in her sick bed, with the little strength that she had, mom would call me to her bedside. She would get up and position herself behind me and then braid my hair before I left for school. I could have done it myself, but mom would do this for me every single day. 
and to this day braiding my hair holds such a sentimental value to me. Back in the day, most mothers owned a small leather lipstick case with a tiny mirror inside. Mom had one of those too. She loved bright colors and would always carry her favorite lipstick of the season with her inside that case. To this day, I clearly remember the smell of her lipsticks, her fragrance. After her death, I kept that leather case with me with the last lipstick that she had used. It still smells like her. Her favorite hymn was Lily of the Valley. She made me memorize it in Tenedie and I still haven't forgotten the lyrics. Every single time I sing this song, it reminds me of her laughter, the joy that she exuded in any room. If tolerance had a face, it would have been hers. She was the light of our family, so strong, so independent, so brave. She blessed me with all those qualities as well. She taught me to be responsible, to be kind. Often, she didn't even need to teach me. I learned from her actions. Many say I've been blessed with her hair and her hands, and I couldn't be happier. One of my favorite authors, Ocean Vuong, said in an interview regarding his mother's death, I might still be too young in my grief to know where it ends. I resonate so much with these words because, despite grieving for 15 years, I still feel too young in my grief. People say I feel too much, I miss too much, I cry too much, but that's my coping mechanism. It doesn't mean I'm sad or unhappy. Rather, I'm more cheerful and optimistic than most people around me. I'm just hit with this grief of losing her in certain moments of my life and I let myself stay in that moment, take in my feelings, clench my fists and shed tears if I need to. Then I get back on track. To cherish the memories with her while doing my best to make her proud is the goal. My loss, my grief, continues to teach me how to navigate through all the emotions that I experience. It feels so personal, but never lonely. Because I've learned to accept that grief is overwhelming, and everyone goes through it, just in different ways. That was Anungla reading Kamrila's essay, Finding Strength in Vulnerability. After the reading, we asked Anungla to share her thoughts about the essay, and here is what she said. Kumrila describes how it felt when her mother passed away. Everything was going great until it didn't. When I read this, I knew exactly what she meant. I think... No human can deny knowing what this feels like, you know, no matter what your age or the context. But death is something else. I lost my mother in the month of October last year and suddenly I was face to face with what she's passed away felt like. What she's no more meant. My little self felt left behind and I had this heavy broken feeling where my heart was. My mother was gone, to a realm at such a distance away that I just couldn't reach it. I felt a deep loss in such a vast sense, and there was so much sadness. I also felt regret and guilt. 
But above all, I felt the silence, you know, the finality that is death. Grief is the wisest teacher. It grew me mentally, physically, emotionally and spiritually. It was like a tough learning curve. And what I learned best to do was to embrace it. You know, we all live in the unknowing of the day when we ourselves will pass on to that unknown realm. But keeping alive the memories then becomes as a bridge spanning the immeasurable distance between us and those who have gone before us. I think memory serves to bind us together so closely, even when we are so far apart from each other. Kumrila says, Many say I've been blessed with her hair and her hands, and I couldn't be happier. You know, joy really is something else. It lives on in grief too. It just tends to stream in with a remembrance and like with a golden thread, it starts to bind together the brokenness inside. Yes, grief broke something in me and I don't think I'll ever be whole again. That's just how I feel. But then what else can you do in response but allow the joy to come in? It starts to soften up the hard part of loss that we still feel and it teaches us to manage the void that we have to face. There are, I suppose, as many definitions of grief as there are humans on earth, but the joy that invariably comes in. Isn't this but love, the most precious gift of all in life? I just choose to think that it is. My heart goes out to Kamrila. She would have been just 12 years or so, old enough to understand what was going on, but too young to have any real answers to questions that may have been half-formed at best. Her essay was powerful in its simplicity, and I'm so glad that she wrote from the perspective of the child that she was about a season frozen in time. Anungla, in her reflection speaking on Kumrila and her own loss, asks, Isn't this but love, the most precious gift of all in life? And she goes on to say, I just choose to think it is. I choose to think so too. Before we end, let me read a poem that was sent by Karen L. Donahue from Shillong. Karen, how are you doing, my dearest? The simplicity of the question belies the complexity of the response it evokes in me. How do I tell you, Pervin, that I am broken and breaking? that every feeling is an effort, that I am yearning for numbness and sleep, that I don't feel at home in myself or anywhere else, that I'm overwhelmed by my desire for distance from everything and everyone. Even as I try hard to be here, even as I try hard to be, that even being asked how I'm doing feels like an indictment that sends me spiraling down into thoughts that are black and sticky. And I come away from you black and guilty because now I must lie and type just a tad busy but all okay. White Space is a production of Take One. It is written and directed by Nitonyo Tongoi and Sesino Hyosha. The essay for this episode was edited by Kutaina Jamir and sound recorded by Kedir Kritio Satsu. 
signature tune by Nurhe Kate and original score by Tizo Nieka. The art piece for White Space was created by Limatola Lankomer. I'm Susan Nangami. Thanks for listening.